Okay. Go ahead. Do you know Krishna's mother? Sun Young Moons? How about Buddha's mother or Muhammad's? Do you know Zarathustra's or Barack Obama's mother? Do you know their names? Have you ever heard of Amina? How about Queen Maha Maya? No? They're the mothers of Muhammad and Buddha, respectively. And unless you're a biographer of either man, you probably never heard of them. Why do I bring this up? How about the mother of Jesus? Do you know her name? Have you heard of her? Of course you have. We all have. As has every generation for 2,000 years. And this, my friends, is the stunning part about this truth. It is that Mary herself, maybe at 14, maybe at 16, predicted that you would know her. And Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaid. For behold, from henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. Luke chapter 1. So imagine for a moment the audacity of an unwed pregnant teen of a subjugated people from an insignificant town, predicting that she would be mo known in a most positive way for generations to come. What are the uh, odds of that coming true? Setting Mary aside, let's do a comparative statistical analysis by choosing for her competition, the most prominent woman of the first century. If I asked you to identify the most famous woman of the first century, a mere 30 years after the death of Christ, would you be able to tell me her name? What if I told you that she was daughter of one of Rome's most celebrated generals and great granddaughter, great niece, sister, wife, and mother to five different emperors? Would it be fair to pit a hillbilly Jewess against royal Roman blood? Yet history has already turned the page on Agrippina the Younger. The mother of all wages, what would you set the odds at if the first century, if in the first century you were asked to pit Mary of Nazareth, wife of the carpenter, uh, mother to Jesus? against Julia Agrippina, great-granddaughter of Augustus, great-niece and adopted granddaughter of Tiberius, daughter of Germanicus, sister to Caligula, wife to Claudius, and mother of Nero, a woman who virtually ruled the Roman Empire for the first half dozen years while her son got his sea legs on. How would odds makers have set the bet as for who would be known in a hundred years, in a thousand, in two thousand? You might call it divine trash talk. I don't know. You see, one of the things about the God of the Bible that you may not have known is that when it comes to talking trash, he makes Michael Jordan look like Urkel. He asks you to compare him to other gods. He heckles those other gods. And at times, he even taunts the worshipers of those gods to put up or shut up. And on at least one occasion, he forwards an alibi to the adherents of an AWOL opponent by suggesting that the reason for the no-show may be that their god is relieving himself in the woods. Uh, look it up. Then there's Mary. And through Mary, he tells the world that the mother of Jesus is bigger, is better, is stronger, is more famous, is more loved, is more talked about than Muhammad's 
Buddhas, Krishna's, Hirohito's, or Obama's mother. Mary, mother of Jesus, will be blessed in word, in song, in legend, in statue, in oil slick, in burnt toast, in potato chips, and in dreams for the rest of history. The Virgin Mary will be history's favorite mother when Amina, Mahamaya, Devaki, Sadako, and Stanley Ann are less than an asterisk in a forgotten book. And God does this over and over again to get the stilted, the deaf, the dumb, and the obstinate to take notice. That's you and me. And that's why the angel tells Mary, with God, all things are possible. He's constantly taking the weak, the foolish, the base, the despised, and calling the world to attention, saying, watch this. Or some might say, hold my beer. From henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. And Mary makes this comment even before Jesus is born. The boast is uttered before he's worshipped by shepherds or magi, before he's prophesied over by Simeon or Anna, before he startles the lawyers in the temple or feeds the thousands, before he straightens the withered hand, gives sight to the blind, before he gives hell to the self-righteous or calms a wayward sea. Mary is convinced that her relationship to this unborn child will bring her world renown before he ever forgives his tormentors or conquers death or ascends to the right hand of the Father. Well, there may be some surface similarities between Christ or Muhammad and Buddha. The differences are legion. Only one of these men claimed deity, only one, the capacity to forgive sins. And only one of these men has left us an empty grave. Well, the cynic will pass over these curiosities, but the honest skeptic has got to ask why, how, who is like unto him? For that matter, who is even like unto his mother? One more note, to those who make more of Mary than even she would, look at her words closely one more time. She does not magnify herself. She's not co-redemptix. And she wouldn't condemn, well, actually, she would condemn anyone who would foolishly elevate her to such a blasphemous juxtaposition. See, Mary knew that there is one mediator between God and man, and Mary knew that man was not merely her child, but her Savior, the Son of God. My soul doth magnify the Lord. Yes, highly favored of God, but seeking to magnify him with her soul. My spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. Of more faith than the just priest Zacharias, but still recognizing her need of a savior. A sinless, perpetual virgin has no need of a savior. And she doesn't speak from apparitions or crying statues. She doesn't need to. Not in the upper room or even at the crucifixion, but Mary's last recorded words are found at the inauguration of our Lord's earthly ministry. Speaking to the servants of the feast at the wedding at Cana, Mary says, whatever he says to you, do it. Her last words were recorded by the Holy Spirit of God and they are more than sufficient for us. If she were here today, she'd probably just say, didn't you hear me the first time? Hear ye him and get to it. Why do we not hear from Mary, the mother of our Lord, after the wedding? I believe the reason is caught up in the baptizer's admonition when he says, he must increase, but I must decrease. Well, there were things that Mary pondered, even that made her marvel. 
the uniqueness of her son and her place in history for the blessing of bearing him were not a mystery to her. Mary did know. Do you? Have you considered the Christ? For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. He that believes on the son has everlasting life and he that believes not the son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. John 3. Friends, I hope you have a joyous Christmas. May God bless your time together in family and friendships. May you be alert to those who may be hurting at this time of the year. And may we always keep in mind that the light of the world is a man, is Jesus Christ. And he came to seek those who are lost, to straighten the withered hand, to free the prisoners. And this is the day of salvation. So go ye into the world and do likewise. Be his hands and his feet. Speak as the very oracles of God. And what a great New Year's resolu resolution would that be? Thanks for listening.